If your patient is protecting their airway and able to cough up all of the blood that they're producing, it's probably their most protective mechanism. As soon as you intubate the patient, you've taken that. So I'm almost always doing RSI. And so as soon as you do that, you've paralyzed the patient and they have no cough. I have the bronch tower at the bedside because I know I'm going to immediately need to start clearing out blood and clots. Welcome to Critical Care Time, the podcast for everyone who cares for the critically ill. I'm your co-host, Dr. Cyrus Askin. And I'm your other co-host, Dr. Nick Mark. What fun and excitement have you cooked up for us today, Cyrus? Well, you know, I'm glad you asked. Uh, so today we're recording with a very special guest, a dear friend of mine and a mentor of mine, Dr. Whitney Warren, who's an accomplished pulmonologist and intensivist. She is a critical care tour de force, if I've ever known one. Her interests include interventional pulmonary, ECMO, pulmonary hypertension, cystic fibrosis. She does it all. And we're so excited to have her here. Uh, like I said, She's a great friend and a mentor, harkening back to my days in fellowship um, when she was one of my staff and just a great um, a great person to collaborate with. I uh, can't thank her enough. And so I'm really glad we're able to bring her on today. Um, and really what we're going to do is pick her brain and ask from an IP standpoint how an interventional pulmonologist and intensivist might manage hemoptysis in the ICU. So with all of that, Whitney, it's so great to host you today on Critical Care Time. Would you mind telling the audience a little bit about yourself? First, thanks so much for having me on the podcast, Cyrus. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, a bit about me. First, I'm a mom and then a physician. I have three little ones that keep me on my toes all the time. I absolutely adore them. ICU was kind of my uh, first love, so I'm really excited to talk about some critical care medicine. It's what drew me to the the field of pulmonary critical care. And then over time, I had some really good mentors who showed me how fantastic pulmonary could be, and then uh, interventional pulmonary. And that was kind of my path to where I am. And um, as a former military physician, I was able to do kind of a little bit of everything and become kind of a jack of all trades. And so that's how my interests are sort of so varied. Um, and I'm really excited to be here and talk about this topic. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Um, we're really excited to pick your brain about the IP approach to hemoptysis. Um, I think we can all agree that these are some of the scariest cases, some of the most memorable cases. Um, and, you know, I think it's it's something where if we can impart some wisdom to our audience, that it's going to be a really great episode. <laughs> All right. So now that we've sort of introduced the topic a little bit, Whitney, before we get really into the down and dirty, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about interventional pulmonary medicine. You know, one of our goals on critical care time is to help early career physicians and trainees figure out what they might want to do, um, you know, with their lives, in their careers. And I'll be honest, until I met you, um, I really didn't know that interventional pulmonary was a field outside of pulmonary medicine. I thought I was done with any sort of additional training I could do. And then you kind of opened my eyes a little bit. Whitney, could you tell us a little bit about about your, uh, your neck of the woods? Yeah, so interventional pulmonary as a formal specialty is a fairly young field. I mean, it's been around for a long time and it's mostly just been guys and gals who are, you know, pulmonologists doing creative things to try to help people. And over the last few years, it's become more formalized training. And basically, IP uh, uses endoscopic and percutaneous modalities to perform minimally invasive procedures for diagnosis and treatment. A lot of it focuses on malignancy, but also non-malignant diseases. Um, and it's usually about a, a one-year fellowship uh, right now. There are some programs that do two years with some research component to that. I was drawn to IP because I really like procedures, but I'm not a surgeon. Um, and IP is a great in between. So you're never going to be doing a 12 hour case, um, but you can do enough to really help somebody feel better in a pretty short period of time. Um, maybe some of this is my inability to be patient, but I really love how in IP you could take somebody with like a tracheal tumor, do a 90 minute debulking and immediately they feel better. Whereas like you're waiting four to six weeks for Advair to take effect. <laughs> so I really liked IP that you could get kind of immediate results without having to be in an OR for 10 or 11 hours. I find that super gratifying. Great. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for giving us the skinny on, on IP. I feel like it's, um, the, a lot of the fun procedural parts of poem, but like cranked up to 11. Um, super cool. Um, so turning, turning to, uh, the topic of the day, massive hemoptysis, we should probably start off by defining massive hemoptysis. Um, how, how would you define that Whitney? Yeah, so I feel like I've had a, sort of a, 
philosophical shift in how I define homoptosis over the last few years as I've run into some cases that have opened my eyes a little bit. I used to get into discussions about what's the volume, you know, and I, I feel like now I, I think it's less important what the actual volume is. And I try to define it based on life-threatening versus non-life-threatening homoptosis, because that really depends on your patient and the situation. So if you have a 20-year-old, you know, robust young man coming in who's coughing up blood, that person's going to be able to handle a volume that's probably a lot more than if you have an 80 year old who just came off the vent, who's got a trach in place and has a very weak cough. So, you know, 50 cc's of blood in that person may be life threatening. Whereas that young 20 year old with this really robust cough, you know, they may be able to, to handle, you know, three, 400 mls of blood if they're actively expectorating it. So I really think the the question to ask yourself is, is this life-threatening or not life-threatening? And that that's kind of how I define, you know, massive. Um, massive hemoptysis in my mind is life-threatening hemoptysis. Excellent. So it's not a volume. There's no magic of staring at a spot and guessing how many <laughs> mLs it is. It's totally exactly. about the context of how is this harming the patient. And one one maybe quick point we could clarify for our audience too is um, we're never worried about somebody bleeding to death from hemoptysis. We're worried right. about somebody being unable to oxygenate um, due to hemoptysis. So it right, really matters yeah. where I, the this... blood is, not how much blood is lost. Exactly. And this is always the conversation, you know, sometimes when I'm headed to the OR for a case, if I'm doing a tumor debulking or something like that, they'll ask me if I have blood on hold. And I'm always like, well, I mean, we can if you want to, but if I have a significant airway bleed, it's much more likely that the patient will suffocate than bleed to death. So obviously, you know, I'm always prepared for that case when I'm doing an interventional case and a tumor debulking or something like that. But it, you know, I'm, I'm less worried about somebody bleeding to death and I'm always much more worried if there's a significant airway bleed that they're going to suffocate. I think those are both uh, excellent points. It's, it's not about the volume necessarily. It's, it's sort of about the volume in the context of the patient. Mm -hmm. So if someone's much more robust, much healthier, fewer comorbidities, they're probably going to tolerate more uh, bleeding into their airway and into the alveoli than someone who's much sicker, someone who has pre-existing uh, structural lung disease, let's say, um, you know, they're, they're not really going to be tolerant of a whole lot of hemoptysis before things start to get uh, squirrely. I, I, at least that's the way I approach it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, now that we have kind of a working definition, sort of getting getting away from specific numbers and focusing more on more patient centered outcomes, why don't we talk about a case that perhaps our listeners might encounter in the ICU? And so, um, you know, we've drummed up this one for, for you, Whitney, giving you a, a nice good curveball to see if we can challenge you here. Um, so let's say we've got a 26 year old female and she's got a history of cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis. Um, she recently had an, ex an exacerbation due to pseudomonas six months ago, and that was evidenced by a 10% drop in her FEV1. She had some increased coughs, sputum production, some worsening dyspnea, despite increasing her airway clearance measures. So she, she experienced that, but fortunately she had you to expertly guide her through the ordeal, got her feeling better. Life was good. Um, but you did get some repeat imaging that showed her bronchiectasis had worsened, um, following that ordeal. Um, and so, you know, you thought things were going well, but unfortunately you get a call that this patient is back in the emergency department with some hemoptysis. Um, the ED doc is spending a lot of time trying to quantify the amount of bleeding, uh, pretty much to, to no avail, but he does seem worried. Um, labs were obtained. They're not terribly remarkable, uh, but the patient is starting to trend towards tachycardia and blood pressures do appear to be a little bit lower than baseline. So with all of that said, Whitney, um, what would your immediate concerns be for a patient like this? How would you approach them right off the bat? So I think it's always important to remember the basics when you have a patient coming in with homoptysis. So um, similar to any patient who's critically ill, the first thing you want to do is, you know, stabilize the patient. So it's pretty worrisome if they're starting to get tachycardic and hypotensive. If this has been going on for a really long time, especially in a patient with cystic fibrosis, if they've been coughing up blood for days and days and days, and it's a significant amount, then they may have been able to cough up enough blood that they're actually going to need transfusions and they could be hypotensive from it. So it's a pretty worrisome situation if you're getting to the point where you're tachycardic and you're hypotensive. So 
the first thing I'm doing is, okay, let's make sure that we're resuscitating this patient. Um, that would be the first thing in my head. Um, and then I would, with that volume of blood, you know, uh, again, circling back to what we said before, a lot more worried about, okay, is this patient going to experience airway loss and suffocate if this is the kind of volume that they're really coughing up? Excellent. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a great first step, like focus on the basics, think about the chronicity of it. Um, so let's let's take the case a little further. So you're now at the bedside, you're assessing the patient, you decide you're going to admit her to the ICU for airway monitoring. And then as you get her to the ICU and you're reevaluating her, you note that she's still protecting her airway, she's maintaining normally, but she looks uncomfortable. She's clearly in distress, she's using accessory muscles, she's working hard. Um, so what what labs, what interventions, what do you want to do up front in like the first, you know, 10, 20 minutes now that this person is in your ICU? I think the first rule of any sort of bleeding is correct the coagulopathy if it's present. You know, so if you have labs that show that the patient is coagulopathic, then I would immediately start correcting that. I'm running through the patient's med list. Are they on any sort of anticoagulation? Is there anything else that I can be reversing? And when I get called about a patient like this in the ER, while I'm getting all my tools together and meeting them in the ICU, I'm asking the ER doctor, hey, can you start a TXA neb? You know, I know the data for TXA nebs in massive hemoptysis or life-threatening hemoptysis is less. It's more for um, non-life-threatening hemoptysis, but there are case series that support inhaled TXA or nebulized TXA in the setting of uh, life-threatening hemoptysis, and it can buy you some time. And anecdotally, in my experience, I've had a couple of patients that were having significant hemoptysis who I said, okay, let's start a TXA neb while I'm bringing the therapeutic scope over, while I'm getting the tower, while we're getting ready to intubate. And it was able to stabilize the patient. So I do think it, it's an option that you have while you're trying to get everything ready to intubate the patient um, and, and likely bronc the patient. Now, obviously, if the patient is able to lay flat, then I think a CT with contrast is probably the best way to diagnose where the bleed is coming from. But if the patient is too unstable to lay flat, they're coughing up too much blood, they can't protect their airway, then you should probably just skip that CT and you should go straight to uh, moving the patient to the ICU, intubating the patient and getting ready to bronch the patient. Yeah. So um, great point. I also love TXA. I agree with you that, you know, the evidence is stronger for minor, but I think one point to emphasize to our audience is that you often don't know up front whether a bleed is going to be life-threatening or not. So treat it as if the TXA may work. And if the TXA doesn't work, you tried it. Um, exactly. Yeah. We should probably double click and just tell our audience kind of like, how do you do this? Like nuts and bolts, like, you know, the ED doc, you know, ED docs love TXA, second only to ketamine, I think. So they're going to be excited about this, but they're going to say like, I didn't know you could nebulize it. How do you do that? And what, what would you tell them? Yeah. So, so actually I get asked this question all the time. So TXA nebs are super easy to do. So get the vial of TXA. It usually comes in a gram. Um, take 500 milligrams of TXA and dilute it in five to 10 mLs of saline, just like a, a you know a saline neb. And then you nebulize that uh, the same way you would nebulize albuterol and you have the patient breathe it in. Um, and, and that's basically all you do. It's really easy. 500 milligrams and five to 10 mLs of saline nebulized. And you can do another Perfect. one. And the side effects of TXA, inhaled TXA, are very low. So I've been asked that question too. So there is some risk of bronchospasm. So if you wanted to pre-treat or post-treat with albuterol, you can do that. There's also risk of airway casting. So if the patient is bleeding and you're doing a TXA nub, then you can cast the airway with a clot. But Often when you've come to that point, you actually kind of need that. You need that tamponade effect. So there is some airway casting that you might have to deal with on the back end. Uh, but otherwise, the side effect profile of TXA nebs, very, very low. And the risk of systemic clotting with a TXA neb is extremely low. Woody, I'm so glad that you mentioned the casting because when I've worked in other places, not with you, of course, but when I've worked in other places and that question has come up uh, of like, you know, opting for a TXA neb, 
someone invariably is like, oh, well, all you're going to do is cause all that blood to clot. It's going to occlude the airway. It's going to make it even worse. Then we're going to have to go and fish it out. And, and you might actually cause that patient to decompensate in the meantime. I, I haven't seen that myself, but I admittedly have not seen as many, um, you know, really worrisome airway bleeds as the two of you. But it seems like one of those things where it's like commonly discussed, but but perhaps in reality, it's not as big of a deal. Yeah, it definitely can happen. And if you're at a place that has interventional or you have cryo, then, you, you know, using a cryo probe, you can pull those casts out pretty easily. But you can also get those casts out with forceps or just good suction a lot of the time. And really, yeah. I've, I've never found that casting to generally be life threatening. It's annoying and it may cause the patient to have difficulty coming off the ventilator and you may have to treat it in order to allow the patient to come off the ventilator and completely clear their airways. But I've never found it to be life-threatening, whereas the, the bleeding certainly can be. And when we talk about, you know, since you mentioned treating, we talk about treating a patient in that circumstance. Once once we're out of the woods, once we've stabilized the bleed, is that someone that you might treat with like a, a heparin neb or, you know, do you just go in and do airway, you know, airway clearance with your your bronchoscope? How would you treat that on the back end once once you're you're convinced there's no more active hemoptysis? Yeah, I, I think if you had done a TXA neb and you had significant casting, then, you know, my choice would be to use a cryoprobe and pull out the cast with a cryoprobe because I think that's the out. easiest way. And you can get pretty much the whole cast, sometimes in one fell swoop. Sometimes it becomes a labor of love and you end up pulling out smaller chunks at a time with the cryoprobe. But that's usually my go-to for, for removing cast from the airway. Perfect. Okay, great. So, you know, we spent some time now talking about TXA nebs, how to manage them both uh, initially and then down the road. So we'll go ahead and say that at this point, you know, um, we've given our, T our TXA neb, we've got some access, we've got two large bore IVs that we're, we're happy with. Um, we'll say that labs don't really reveal any coagulopathy, but hemoglobin, oddly enough, has dropped three points for the patient's baseline. Um, you know, she's sitting at 7.4. You talk to her a little bit more. It, it sounds like she's been dealing with some degree of hemoptysis for longer than she initially let on. Um, and so, you know, you look at the monitor, heart rate is continuing to trend up, blood pressure is continuing to trend down, and now our maps are flirting with the low 60s. So this is sort of that maybe rare case where there's also a component of emerging hemorrhagic shock from a, a, a kind of acute on chronic airway bleed, if you will. Um, and so this person, you know, you, you take a moment to put it in arterial line so you can monitor her blood pressure more closely. Um, once that's done, you step out of the room briefly just to kind of collect yourself and you get called right back in for a large episode of quote unquote projectile hemoptysis that the nurse describes as being uncomfortably red. Um, so the patient is still responsive, but she still looks worse. Skin pallor is noted, some delayed capillary refill, and heart rate and blood pressure are now persistently worrisome. So what are we going to do now with this patient? So re resuscitation is first. Um, in, you know, this is the type of patient that you're going to do a massive transfusion protocol. If you truly think that the reason that they're hypotensive and tachycardic is because of bleeding, I would initiate our massive transfusion protocol. And then because they're having such large volume of hemoptysis, I would be preparing to intubate this patient. And I want to make a point here. So if your patient is protecting their airway and able to cough up all of the blood that they're producing, it's probably their most protective mechanism is that strong cough. As soon as you intubate the patient, you've taken that. So I, I'm a strong believer in RSI. I, when I'm intubating a patient, I'm almost always doing RSI. And so as soon as you do that, you've paralyzed the patient and they have no cough. So that's the patient that as I'm intubating them, I have the bronch tower at the bedside because I know I'm going to immediately need to start clearing out blood and clots. Otherwise, they're going to clot off their trachea. They're going to clot off their airway because you've taken away that super protective mechanism. So if I have to intubate, I do it, but it's kind of the, it's kind of my last resort for hemoptysis unless I think the patient's losing the battle in terms of coughing and clearing their airway because it's so protective. So you really want to be ready to go to clear out that airway with the therapeutic bronchoscope because it has the largest working channel, the best suction. And I'll often have like a 14 French trach suction at the at the bedside as well so that I get that tube in, I'm throwing that 14 French trach suction down the ET tube and I'm sucking out any clot that has accumulated in the time that it took me to intubate the patient. 
Excellent. Okay. And sometimes, you know, people sort of fixate on the the gear, the equipment, right? I can't debate this person because I don't have a double lumen and a tracheal tube. How do you what's your what's your reaction to that? Yeah. Oh man. Fans double. fans of the show who are watching video <laughs> just saw just saw her reaction to that. <laughs> Double lumen uh, ET tubes are are pretty uh, difficult to place quickly, so it wouldn't be my first uh, go to. Honestly, I would be using um, a single lumen ET tube and and the biggest one I thought I could get in, so that I can easily use a therapeutic bronchoscope and a blocker and whatever else I think I'm going to need to put through that ET tube. So I'm at least trying to get it eight and a half, maybe an eight if, I, if it's a really small person and I think it's going to be a difficult airway. But my approach to intubating a patient like this is I'm going to be using um, DL. I, I wouldn't use a video in a situation like this because if you have a lot of blood, usually your camera is going to be immediately obscured by the blood and you're going to lose your view. So I'd be using DL with suction. And probably as I'm putting that DL in, I'm putting my suction into clearing, trying to get a view of the cords or at least the bubbles, you know, and that's where I'm shooting to place my ET tube. Great. Well, uh, fans of the show can look forward to a future episode where we debate DL versus VL. And I think this is one of the key points we're going to talk about. <laughs> so, so plug for the future there. Um, let's, uh, let's move the case along. So, um, you're, you're getting ready to go. Um, you decide to, you decide, decide to intubate, you intubate successfully as you've just outlined. Um, and then, um, and now that you, now that you have the tube in your therapeutic scope is in the room. What do you, what do you, what are you doing next? What's your approach now? So once I've got the ET tube in, like I said, I'm probably throwing some sort of real large suction down it immediately. And this probably isn't the scope because if it took you a second to get the patient intubated and they've been paralyzed, then your trachea and possibly your ET tube is probably pretty full of blood. So if you've got a very large suction catheter, like a 14 French, and you put it down there, then that will allow you to really suck up a lot of clot really fast, much faster than a scope. You throw your scope down there, you're going to be having to pull the clot physically out because it probably won't come through even a 2.3 working channel on a therapeutic scope. So something big like a 14 French trach suction, they're really long too. So you can get down pretty far and clear your trachea out. As soon as I do that, and I'm pretty convinced I've got a clear path for the therapeutic scope, then I'd be going down with a therapeutic scope to try to identify the location of the bleed. Now, most of the time, I would say when I've been in this situation, I can kind of get a sense which side it's coming from. And then you want to look, you want to focus on trying to tamponade that side. Now, here's the point where I'm going to say something a little controversial. So I'm going down with the therapeutic scope to try to find the exact location of the bleed and, and basically create some tamponade effect. And this is where I'm calling for a balloon. Now, in my practice, I try to have a pulmonary CRE uh, balloon. So, so this is a balloon that radially expands, and you can control the expansion and the pressure. It also has a working channel through the middle of the balloon, and you can see through the balloon. So if I can determine right or left, then I'm going down with that balloon and probably inflating in the main stem and putting TXA um, or chilled saline or lidoethepi or phenylephrine directly through the middle of that balloon into the main stem, trying to start to, to get control of the bleeding. Then I probably drop the balloon, try to suction and advance the balloon and basically work my way to the area of the bleed. Um, if it's lower lobe, you know, getting down to the subsegmental level. If it's upper lobe, you know, trying to, if I can flex that balloon into the upper lobe and you know, as this is all happening, I'm having someone call IR because the things that I'm going to do, I'm going to identify the bleed. I'm going to stabilize the patient. And then most patients are going to need some form of IR embolization. Because when you think of where these bleeds are coming from, I would say like 90, 95% are coming from the bronchial artery circulation. So it's high pressure circulation and they're going to ultimately need to be embolized to make the bleeding stop. The rest of it is like bleeding from things like granulation tissue, like rarely you can get some venous bleeding, things like that. Maybe you have a bleeding tumor. 
but when it's not a tumor in the airway uh, and it's somebody like this patient who had bronchiectasis, then it's most likely going to be a bronchial ar artery bleed that's going to need to be embolized. If things are really out of hand and you can't see anything, you have some idea which side the bleeding is coming from, then you get kind of back to the basics. So you can position the patient with the bleeding side down before or after you've intubated the patient. And then one technique, um, and I'm going to shout out to uh, Michael Sobieszczyk. This is his, his technique. He's one of my interventional colleagues um, uh, from my mi military days. One of the things that you can do is intubate the patient and actually main stem on the side of the bleed. So you know you have a right side to bleed. You main stem on that side and you just shove the blocker through the ET tube uh, as kind of as deep as you can get it. And as you pull the ET tube back, you're advancing the blocker under direct visualization and using a bronchial blocker to obstruct the airway. And, and this is sort of the controversial part that I'll talk about. So endobronchial blockers are not my favorite thing. In fact, I feel like they're really cumbersome to place and difficult to use. I use them a lot, but I'm usually using them in a very controlled setting, like when I'm doing a cryobiopsy preventatively. And I'll tell you, you know, I could spend like 10 minutes fiddling, placing the, the blocker perfectly. Um, and, and so in an emergent situation, they can be very difficult to place. If you're trying to lasso the end of the blocker and put it into an upper lobe, most of the time you're not going to be successful. So in this kind of a situation with this technique, it's really you're, you're main stemming into the bleed and you're not lassoing the blocker. You're just shoving it through the ET tube because you can see it and you're getting it into the main stem and then you're inflating it and pulling your ET tube back to the level of the carina. And now you basically have a main stem blocked and you're ventilating the good lung. And you can do that same technique that I was talking about with the CRE balloon, where you drop the, the blocker balloon and you progressively insert it and try to find the level of the bleeding. The blocker won't fit through the, uh, through the uh, therapeutic scope. So you lose some of that control over where you're placing that balloon, whereas a CRE balloon does fit through a therapeutic scope. So your control of where that balloon is placed is much better. The downside of a CRE balloon, though, is you're stuck <laughs> with that scope in that patient with that balloon until you get control of that bleeding. And so sometimes that means you're headed with the patient, you know, to IR, uh, and it's not probably the best situation to be in if you think that that balloon may need to stay. So if it's a blocker that you're like, oh, this is probably going to have to stay for, you know, four to six hours, or I'm not in a place that readily has IR and the patient's going to need to transfer. In that situation, you definitely should be using an endobronchial blocker because you you can lock those in place. They Most of them have a side port that screws down and you can lock the blocker in place. Um, and then you you basically have to do blocker maintenance, which is a little bit of a hassle. It's checking the balloon every couple hours, at least bringing the balloon down, you know, three times a day to prevent mucosal ischemia. And there's a, a link in the, the show notes of a really good article that talks kind of about blocker placement and what to do um, in terms of blocker maintenance once you have one in place. But those are some of the techniques that I would be thinking about once the patient is intubated and, and I'm getting in the airway, trying to think of how what, do I control um, this What advice bleed? would you have for somebody who, who has not done a pulmonary or IP fellowship, somebody who maybe <clears throat> knows how to hold a scope, knows how to use a bronchoscope, but doesn't really feel comfortable with all the toys? You know, what, what should they be doing, assuming like a, an, an ER doc? or somebody who's critical care, tra critical care trained, but not pulmonary trained has, has intubated this person. Yeah. So, you know, in that situation, probably your best bet is a main stem intubation because it, it's not that hard to do. And so if you don't have a lot of toys available or you don't have, you don't have a pulmonologist available or IP available and you know which side the patient is bleeding from. So maybe you just got a chest x-ray and you see an infiltrate on the right side and the patient is having a ton of hemoptysis. Well, you're probably safe to assume that it's coming from the right side. So then you would 
try to left main that patient while you're calling IR. Because most people can be okay on single lung ventilation. Now, the patient may be hypoxic, but they're not going to be dead. So you kind of got to take what you can get. So you may have a patient that's satting like 88, you know, not, not having amazing sats on maximum vent support, um, but at least they could be stable enough to maybe go for an embolization. Main stemming a patient who's having a significant airway bleed is probably the easiest technique that you could start with up front. The other thing I would say is know what tools you have in your ER or your ICU. This is probably the most important point of this entire podcast is wherever it is that you are, know what you have readily available and get comfortable with it. So if all you have is a disposable scope and an endobronchial blocker, then play with those ahead of time. Figure out how you turn that scope on, how you plug it in, figure out what sizes of blockers your ICU has or your emergency department has. Most emergency departments or ICUs will have some form of an endobronchial blocker. And knowing what the sizes are will help you because if, the, if it's a really small blocker, they're not going to be very long and you won't be able to reach the lower lobes. So getting a feel for all of your equipment ahead of time, busting that equipment out, playing with the blocker, playing with the balloon, realizing how the blocker inserts into the adapter onto the ET tube, that's all stuff that you got to do ahead of time uh, before you actually run into a patient who is having a life-threatening airway bleed. I think that's a fabulous point, that this is the classic high-acuity, low-occurrence event. And one mm -hmm. of the biggest challenges of those circumstances is having to deal with unfamiliar equipment under stressful circumstances. Or worse yet, talk somebody else through how to do something with it. And so anything you can do in advance to be familiar with it, to simulate it. And also just a quick plug for our listeners, this idea of sort of mental simulation. So like, I would say like probably like at least one one day a month or one night a month when I like can't fall asleep, I'm just like mentally thinking about some crazy situation that, you know, might someday happen. Like, what would I do if I didn't have this or if I had to do this? And that's actually a great way, I think, to sort of think about like, okay, you know, I don't have my favorite toy. What would my second favorite thing be? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and I, I want to make one point about the main stem intubation. So if you know you're going to main stem someone or you're going to try, um, I would have some form of a bronchoscope at the bedside if you can, because that will help you if you can get the ET tube into the trachea, then you can advance the bronchoscope and guide the ET tube into the main stem that you're trying to accomplish. It could also help you, like if you're right main stemming, it's hard not to jail the right upper lobe. And a lot of people won't be okay just ventilating from the right middle lobe and right lower lobe. So if possible, you can direct your Murphy's eye to the right upper lobe or not completely jail the right upper lobe, um, then that's more ideal. So having a bronchoscope at the bedside, even just a disposable scope to help you with that main stem placement. So Whitney, I want to ask some, some more specifics about IP, but before I do, I want to make sure that I'm uh, clear on... Um, the kind of concept of main stem intubation. So I think there were two separate instances we discussed. One was where you selectively main stem what you think is the bleeding side in an effort to get a balloon down and tamponade uh, as distally as you can versus the other circumstance where you're selectively intubating the non-bleeding side in an effort to maintain oxygenation and ventilation. And, and the, the former um, would be sort of um, what you might do if you have an IP doc that's there with you or if you're more experienced and you're able to do that versus the latter, which is like, okay, I need to stabilize this person and keep them alive so that we can figure out steps B, C, and D. Is that is that accurate? Exactly. Yeah, that's 100% correct. You know, if, if, I'm, if I'm there and I've got my CRE balloon, I'm trying to... I'm trying to isolate the sub segment that's bleeding and keep everything else from getting contaminated, tamponade that sub segment, tell IR exactly what sub segment I think it is. But if this is, you know, if you're in the middle of nowhere, if you're resource limited and all you have is an ET tube, a disposable scope, and maybe a blocker, then 
intubate on the side that's not bleeding, main stem the patient, call for help or find out where am I transferring this patient? You know, how do I stabilize this patient and get them to a higher level of care? Excellent. Well, thank you for clarifying that, Whitney. I think it, it'll help to kind of clearly delineate the two different approaches for our audience. Um, so, you know, now that we've, we've, um, clarified that. Getting back to IP specifically, I know there are some tools that you guys have. We talked a little bit about some of the tamponade techniques. We talked about cryo. I also know you guys um, can do some electrocautery. Can you talk me through a little bit about what you guys might specifically bring to the table um, a little bit later in that patient's course? Absolutely. So it, if it's a CF patient who has really bad bronchiectasis and a bronchial artery bleed, then probably that patient's definitive management is going to be IR embolization and maybe CT surgery resection if they have a focal area of bronchiectasis that's much worse than, you know, the rest of their, their um, parenchyma. But let's say this patient is known to have lung cancer and they are known to have an endobronchial lesion, then that's kind of a different situation. So those, those patients can come in with life-threatening hemoptysis. And that may be the patient that I'm coming to the ICU with a rigid set. I'm intubating them up front with a rigid bronchoscope because the tools that I can fit through a rigid are much larger. It's an enormous suction catheter. I can fit a very large electrocautery instrument through there. I can fit a large balloon to do balloon tamponade through there. So in different situations, I may bring different tools to the ICU to help out with an airway bleed. And the rigid can be really, really helpful for an airway bleed, especially if it's from a tumor. I'll also often in those situations bring uh, APC, so argon plasma coagulation, um, and that can be used to cauterize an area that's bleeding as well. Um, and then uh, YAG laser uh, and other forms of lasers can be used uh, for significant airway bleeds, especially if it's something endobronchial that's bleeding. If it's something like a bronchial artery, those techniques are less useful because you can't see it. Um, but if it's something like a tumor, then those techniques are very useful and, and can be rapidly utilized to stop the bleeding. Um, that's a great summary of all the really cool toys. We should probably talk about the things that don't work as well. Um, what are your thoughts on cold saline or epinephrine? Yeah, so there's been some some recent literature that's kind of looked at epinephrine uh, and cold saline, you know, and 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 also actually TXA and TXA is kind of like the hot thing right now. So um, TXA is getting all the press for you know like post biopsy bleeding, and anecdotally I know uh, some folks who have even used phenyl phenylephrine, so endobronchial phenylephrine for active bleeding. Chilled saline can be effective and epi can be effective in certain situations, um, but it just depends on the degree of bleeding. You know, if you have a large tumor uh, and overwhelming bleeding, then those things may not be as effective as cautery or a laser. Yeah. In, in my experience, I think of cold saline and epi or maybe even topical TXA as kind of like great things after a biopsy that's bleeding more than you expected. Right. But probably not going to be life-saving in a situation like this. Yeah, because, you know, the amount of bleeding just overwhelms your ability to even maybe reach the vasculature to cause that vasoconstriction or formation of a clot with TXA. And so it's really about the, the quantity and the volume. That's why when I'm using those things in the setting of a life-threatening bleed, then I'm usually putting that CRE balloon down, I'm creating a tamponade effect first, and then I'm putting TXA through the middle of the balloon into that area to just provide some, some initial or some uh, additional clot formation. So really, you know, you're first getting that tamponade effect and that's probably what's doing your heavy lifting. Um, so great discussion, Whitney. Um, so just to sort of wrap up the case. So you've intubated this patient, you've gone in with your scope, you've identified where the bleeding is coming from, you have tamponaded it um, distally with your balloon, as you outlined. Um, and now this patient is going to IR. Uh, IR is able to identify the bleeding vessel and embolize it. Um, uh, come upstairs, still intubated. Is there anything else that we that we should talk about at sort of the conclusion phase now? 
Well, sometimes embolization is kind of your final pathway, you know, depending on for, for a patient with cystic fibrosis, depending on what the rest of their lung parenchyma is looking like, if they're having recurrent airway bleeds, they may need to be referred for transplant. If it's a focal area, they may need to be referred for cardiothoracic surgery. Let's say this patient didn't have cystic fibrosis. Maybe they had a mycetoma or they had some other area of bleed. You always want to be thinking about what's the def- the definitive management. And sometimes that is embolization, but sometimes it's one of those other things. So that, that's what I would be thinking about. Um, and then I would also be thinking about, okay, you know, I want to get this patient extubated. What's my plan when I extubate them if they start to cough up blood again? So just always having kind of that backup in in my pocket, knowing that they've already had a life-threatening bleed. Excellent. Um, Yeah, I think um, we could probably, we could probably add more and more flourishes to this case, but I think we should probably, we should probably talk about a different case. Um, In pre-recording, we were chatting about an ECMO patient with hemoptysis that she managed. Do you mind sharing that story and uh, any pitfalls or pearls um, you you learned in that situation? Absolutely. So I think this case very well demonstrates kind of all of the things that you can go through in a, in a really significant life-threatening airway bleed. And it's always a little bit different when you're on ECMO because you can support the patient through an airway bleed that might otherwise be fatal. Um, so I was an early staff and this patient was having a BAL done and they were fully anticoagulated because they were on ECMO. And I was called into the room because there was a sudden fountain of blood coming from the area that had just been lavaged. The patient was intubated and they had attempted a blocker, but it was not able to be placed. It was an upper lobe BAL that was being done. And basically they couldn't sort of turn and make the corner with the blocker. The blocker was lassoed on the end of the ET tube and it just wasn't flexing up. There was a lot of issues with the blocker um, and manipulating it. They had rolled the patient so that the bleeding side was down, which was totally appropriate. And Even so, it was still overwhelming the airways and bleeding into the other side. Um, So we got a 14 French trach suction. We started sucking out clot with that. So put that through the ET tube, disconnected the patient from the circuit, started suctioning out massive amounts of clot while we called for the therapeutic scope and a CRE balloon. Was able to get the therapeutic scope in, the CRE balloon in, and tamponade the area that was that had been lavaged and then started to put uh, TXA, chilled saline, light with epi, everything <laughs> through that segment because it was just so robustly bleeding and eventually it stopped. Um, but this was a situation where the airways completely cl- uh, casted with clot. It was so much blood and bilateral uh, main stems cast it all the way up to the trachea. So after that, I spent several hours with the cryoprobe getting all of that clot out. The only place I didn't remove the the clot from was that upper lobe that had been bleeding. And we just left that so that it would maintain that tamponade effect. And the patient actually ended up doing okay, but it kind of, we kind of went through all of the steps. That patient never got main stemmed, but that was just because that patient was on ECMO. Had that patient not been on ECMO, he would have had to have been main stemmed to the non-bleeding side while everything else was being gathered because it was such a significant bleed. Had he not been on ECMO, he would have died really quickly without a main stem intubation. So moral of the story is it's never just a BAL. (laughs) Um, But that kind of walks you through, you know, sort of all of the steps that you could try in somebody with a significant bleed. It's like a worst case scenario, stuff of nightmares. Yeah. I was, I mean, I was listening to that. I was just the whole time I was thinking, thank goodness he was on ECMO because it would have been right. <laughs> pretty disastrous. I mean, I suppose you right. could argue that maybe the bleed wouldn't have been as bad if he wasn't systemically anticoagulated, but then on the back end, sure, having that yeah, support sure, um, sure. Was, was certainly helpful. So that was a great story, a harrowing tale. Um, thank you for sharing that, Whitney. I, I think really this was a fantastic episode. I'm so grateful for your time, your expertise, your incredible insights. Um, I, I think there's a lot here that our, our audience can learn from, a lot that I, that, that I can learn from, and, I, and, and perhaps Nick as well, well like a lot we, of great we did from yeah that this we did great. learn from um so um you know i'm looking forward to getting to put some of this uh into play at some point in the future um 
you know, Whitney, before we say farewell, let you get back to your kids, let you get back to your life. Is there <laughs> anything in particular you'd like to shout out in regards to, you know, uh, resources that you find helpful as a pulmonologist for maybe some of our early career physicians, some of our trainees? And then are there any particular pitfalls, pearls with respect to massive hemoptysis that you'd like to lead the audience with? Yeah. So I, I think there's kind of five key points that, that I want would want people to take away from this. And the first is CT is probably your best diagnostic tool, highest yield for determining where the bleed is. So if you can get one, get a CT with contrast. The second point is bronchoscopy can stabilize your patient and also diagnose the area of bleeding. So if your patient can't get a CT, then the next thing you should do is probably a intubation followed by a bronchoscopy to try to figure out where the bleeding is coming from. Like I said a number of times, most patients with life-threatening hemoptysis will require embolization, so I would call for help early. If IP is available, call for IP as well because they have a lot of different tools that can help you, but IR is most of the time going to be the one who does kind of the temporizing definitive management for this patient while you try to figure out which pathway they should go go down for their final management. And then the very most important point, I'll reiterate again, know the resources your ICU has. At some point, someone is going to come in with a life-threatening bleed to your ICU. Make your plan ahead of time based on the tools that you have. Excellent. And I think that I think that final point, um, you know, also rings true for our ED colleagues because you know sa- same same rules apply if Absolutely. you're in the emergency department and and you're encountered by one of these. So, um, and then Whitney, uh, again, just one last question. Um, you know, I, I remember um, when I was a trainee and I asked you this question, you turned me on to the the ATS uh, reading list is like a great place to go and sort of bulk up my knowledge. Any anything else that you would um, you would um, uh, recommend as far as like good resources for folks that want to learn about this topic or other topics in pulmonary medicine? Yeah, AABIP also has a lot of good resources on their website for all things interventional pulmonary um, and hemoptysis. So that that's a really good one um, to look at, um, as well as the link that will be uh, in the show notes for endobronchial blockers is a really good one to take a look at. Yes, listeners, if you don't, if you can't picture what these things are, don't worry. Come to our website <laughs> and you will see pictures. You will see links. It's all there. Absolutely. Well, on that note, I think we've come to the part of our show where we like to say thanks. Thanks to, um, first of all, thanks to our guest, Dr. Warren. Um, great having Absolutely. you. You taught us a lot. I have to have you back on sometime. I'm sure there's other IP topics we could talk about. Um, I'd also like to say thanks to our audience, um, especially the people who have given us five-star reviews. Um, or giving us a shout out on social media. We love you guys. We listen to your suggestions. We're actually planning episodes based on your suggestions. So please keep them coming. Um, and yeah, we're just uh, very, very grateful to all of you. Yeah, those five star reviews are really helpful. I, I was just looking at uh, my Spotify and I saw that Critical Care Time is uh, is rated at five out of five stars across the hundred or so reviews. So that's super exciting. What? Um, yeah, really excited. Um, it's good when a passion project like this is appreciated by the masses, and we hope to continue to bring great content and and to bring this great content. We're again super grateful for fantastic guests like Dr. Warren spending her time with us, and we we really do appreciate that. Um, so, like Nick said, if you've enjoyed the show, please take time to subscribe, give us a like give us one of those five star ratings we sure do appreciate it um it does help us tremendously in regards to our uh our um our programming it helps us expand our audience and it really means a lot to nick and i um Additionally, we'd love to hear from you. So if you want to tweet or or X us, I know that Nick is is not a big fan of the the change in name, but um tweet. if if you want to tweet us at uh, Critical Care Time uh, or independently, uh, Nick M. Mark or Askins underscore Razor, uh, we'd love to talk to you and, and have a little bit of a knowledge exchange there. You can also follow us on Instagram and threads. That would be critical underscore care underscore time. And check us out on our Critical Care Time YouTube channel. And of course, the website, www.criticalcaretime.com. We'd also like to say a big thanks to our sponsor, Seastar Medical. Um, we're fortunate and grateful that this episode, like all the episodes in season one, is uh, supported by Seastar Medical. Seastar Medical is advancing the science of cell-directed extracorporeal therapy to help restore the balance of a dysregulated immune system in acute kidney injury and sepsis. Um, they actually have some exciting news out in recent weeks. You should check out their website, seastarmedical.com, to learn more. Exactly. Thank you, Nick, for uh, giving them that shout out. And before we go, we'd also like to thank all the incredible members of our podcast team for helping make this show possible. Uh, That includes our producers over at Podpaste. And last but certainly not least, Kurt Belknap for our awesome theme music.
All right, disclaimer time. The podcast and all related media, including but not limited to animations, graphics, and videos are property of critical care time. Please share our content near and far, but cite your source. And of course, the views expressed within this podcast and any associated media do not necessarily reflect the views of our employers. All references to patients or encounters have been modified to be HIPAA compliant, and thus any similarities to real world cases are purely coincidental. Finally, the podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only and should not be used in lieu of seeking medical advice. With that, thanks again for listening. Thanks again, Dr. Warren, for taking time out of your very busy schedule to help us understand this topic. I am once again, Dr. Cyrus Askin. And I'm Dr. Nick Mark. See you soon. Bye. Bye.